Thank you. And I'd like to thank Margarita for helping with, with the presentation. It's been a lot of work on, on it. So the um, talk today is about the journey of the general manager of very incensed mining district, Yakov Kogrebniak, and his historical tablecloth from Ekaterinburg to San Francisco. As described by his son, Gali, later James J. Grant, and presented by his grandson, myself, William D. Grant. There are um, um, several themes in this presentation. First is the upward mobility through education in Tsarist Russia. Second is aspects of life in Russia before, during, and after the revolution. Third is immigration from Russia. And fourth is life in the United States for a Russian family. Uh, here is a, a brief overview of the family tree. Um, what I want to show here is that um, there's um, we have over here the, the um, maternal grandmother um, with uh, roots in Zubsov, and the paternal uh, grandfather, um, parents of Kazimandar, <coughs> later Krasnodar. So um, Yakov Pogremniak uh, is the main protagonist here in this story, and Maria is his uh, wife. Uh, they uh, had two children, Gali, my father, and Ala, his, his sister. Uh, Helen Burgess married, married my father. We have three children. Uh, Ala married her Stanley, and one child. And we have the, uh, the grandchildren here, the great grandchildren. Uh, and I'll be describing all these people as we go along. So, uh, Russian grandmother, Maria Pavlovna Krasnova, was born in 1882 and died in 1969. Her father, Alexeyevich Nekrasov, and her mother, Tatiana. He was a merchant and at some time mayor of Zubsov, a very small town at 56 degrees north uh, latitude, 70 miles west of Moscow. One of them had one eighth of Tatar ancestry. Uh, uh, Maria had one brother and several sisters. And this is a picture, we think, of Maria as a child with her um, paternal grandmother. So, since uh, Zubsov was too small to have a good secondary school, Maria attended a women's secondary school in Kalin Tver, a town about 100 miles northwest of Moscow, for seven years, and graduated with a gold medal. Maria was one of the first women to attend a university. Society, including her parents, did not approve because many students were radicals plotting to overthrow the governments. Maria did not participate in the movement, even though she became acquainted with one of Lenin's colleagues, a man named Lunacharsky, who became the first minister of education in Lenin's government. Maria graduated from a women's university in St. Petersburg from the Department of Physics and uh, Mathematics with highest honors in October 1908. Uh, Yakov um, Yosevich Pogremniak, born in 1884, died in 1975. His father was Osip Pogremniak. He was a Ukrainian with, my, my, pardon, my father, a peasant upbringing, living in a village bordering Ekaterinodar, later across the river, 45 degrees north, about 200 miles east of Sevastopol. He became a Yuryatnik uh, with the Kuban Cossacks. Um, the question, I'm not sure when he became a Cossack and when he, whether he, he was a peasant, but this is the information from my uh, father. His mother's maiden name, name, name was Efima Filipovna Nesbatalova. So she was Russian, he was Ukrainian. Uh, the children were raised in the uh, Russian language. Yakov um, was born on October 21, uh, 1884. Um, I say they were brought up in the Russian language. His father's Cossack influence was shown in teaching the boys to ride horseback soon after they learned how to walk. To teach Yakov to swim, he and the horse were taken into deep water and he was given the horse's tail to hold on to. It was a matter of sink or swim. Uh, winters in Ekaterinodar they were very cold in those days. 
during winter, people usually stayed indoors. Um, and uh, heat for the cooking and space heating was provided by a wood burning oven. At night, the fire died down, and the children and the sick adults would sleep near the fire of the oven. In summer, they worked very hard to raise the vegetables and fruit and so on, and tend the animals. Yaakov's education. Yaakov started school at the Kadarinadar um, after primary and a few years of secondary school. He went to a trade school and completed the curriculum in 1901 at age 16 with excellent grades. He returned to secondary school and completed it in 1905. Uh, he went to the Mining Institute of St. Petersburg, the, the Mining Institute of Empress Catherine II. It was the most prestigious um, institution of higher learning for mining engineers. Uh, he graduated as a mining engineer in the, with the first rank in June 12, 1912 at age 27. This is a picture of Yakov in 1910 with his student uh, card allowed him to do anything at the university. Oops. And um, this is a picture of um, my, my brother with this mining institute uniform. I had my sister with one of Maria's uh, overcoat, fur overcoats. So, uh, Maria and Yakov uh, were buried in the museum near Donetsk, Ukraine, on October 6, 1909, the town where Maria was living and worked teaching. She taught mathematics, physics, and cosmology at the Lemon's Gymnasium, which is like a high school or a secondary uh, or community college. Uh, Yalik was born in 19, November 1910. Um, Dad always felt that his name was uh, a girl's name. Gaskalina is a very common Russian name for, for, for girls, but Gali is not a common name for boys. He changed his name in 1940 to James J. Grant. Yakov's first job was with the Bogoslovs, later Karpinsk, copper mines near Turyinskia Rudniki in the Ural Mountains. Um, Maria and Galek joined him in October 1912. They stayed there until 1914 when Yakov got a job near Yekaterinburg with the Verkhysetsk mining district. Verkhysetsk. They lived in Verkhysetsk, a company town for the Verkhysetsk mining and mechanical plants. It was a suburb of 20,000 people associated with the iron ore mining and smelting enterprise, connected to Yekaterinburg by a tree line boulevard. Uh, 500 meters long. The uh, Verkhysetsk mining district had the largest iron ore mining and smelting enterprise in the Ural region. The mines were spread over an area of 3,000 square miles. The plant was built by the Russian government in 1726. Uh, this map uh, was hard to see. I just want to show that. Oops. That here is Ekaterinburg down here, and you can see that this area here. Is mainly mountain because there are very few named locations. All the cities uh, surrounding uh, Count River was the uh, junction for for several railroad tracks. So that that made transporting the people and the and the iron easy. Um, so the um, the um, the mining district was sold to Count Borosov in 1758. He was sold it to uh, Slava Yakolev in 1774. The Yakolev family sold it to a British owned stock company in 1912, which had headquarters in St. Petersburg. The, um, their, the, the root sheet roofing they produced covered the world. By the beginning of the 19th century, Viz started to produce sheet metal roofing gland. Smooth, glossy, and durable. Worldwide, it became, became known as the known as the Yakolev, uh, by the name of the then owner of the plant. It was bought by England, France, Spain, at least 300,000 pounds annually, exported to America. It was the vis of iron that covered the roofs of the London Parliament and Notre Dame Cathedral. After the revolution, the plant was looted uh, thoroughly, 
uh, all valuable equipment, machine tools, and tool uh, were taken out, and the shops became neglected. There was even an attempt to blow up the dam, but this survived. Now back to Yaakov. Um, uh, in addition to salary, Yaakov is provided with living quarters. The grounds were a block long and half a block wide. They included a tennis court, a vegetable garden, a formal garden, a yard, a combination barn and stable, and a house. The company also provided two horses with a carriage uh, for summer and a sleigh for winter, as well as a coachman, a watchman, and a gardener. They also had a cow. The house had two stories. There was a telephone, electricity, and plumbing for water brought by horse. So evidently he came in at a very high position as a, probably the chief engineer at that point. Uh, here's my uh, father, Guy, at age five in a, in a studio portrait um, picture showing him on, on uh, s uh, skis or something like that. So uh, Guy learned how to read. He taught himself Russian at age three or four from a primer, primer a book with pictures and words. He surprised his mother one day when she had company by reading newspaper out loud. Unfortunately, he did not do well in school since he was not used to playing, being around other children. His mother did not let him play with, with uh, children unless they were high class, and being in a worker's town, there weren't many there. Um, so when he went to school, he, he, he didn't like it, he ran home from school, and never went back in, uh, in that area. Now, um, the Bogremniaks brought many uh, children's books with them from Russia. So the following pictures are covers and some of the inside pages of children's books they brought to San Francisco and that we've given to the uh, museum here. This one is Goldilocks and the Three Bears. That is a British story about a girl entering the home of three bears, but this was translated into Russian, so um, they, they found it of interest there as well. Um, this is about a, uh, a, a fox and a woodpecker. Somehow the, the, the fox talk, teach, talks the woodpecker into throwing down all the children and then it eats them. Sort of a sad story. Uh, this is a, um, a tale of the cookie. As Margarita explained to me, uh, uh, <laughs> some peasants found, put together enough flour to make a, make a cookie. The cook was very clever and, and was able to escape from the, from the house. It then encountered a bear and a, a, a hare or rabbit, and each time it escaped. But when it met the uh, fox, the fox was very cunning. The fox told the cookie what a nice cookie it was and gave his confidence and ate it. Um, some other stories this is the, uh, uh, I think it's the crow and the donkey. This is a story with pictures. This is something with fish and rocks. Here is a, uh, I guess this is the princess with a squirrel, and the princess looking out of her house. This that person, I think, is holding onto a helium filled balloon, which carries up into the clouds. So, this is um, Yaka's brother, Mitrofan, who was a soldier. He sent a letter to uh, Yakov in 1915, saying, well, "What he was one of, saying he was one of 300 men sent to fight at the Austrian front near Warsaw in July 1915." The letter said, "I know for certain that I, that there are only a few days for me to live in this world, and that I will need to die on the field of battle for the Tsar, for God, and the motherland." When I read this, I, I, tears came to my eyes. But a little bit later, I, I read the next. Page and found he was he sent a letter at Christmas from Persia in 1917. He lived another 20 years or so, so he didn't die in the field of battle. Um, uh, Rasputin. Uh, Yakov took a number of trips to St. Petersburg. On one of those trips, he was on the same coach as Rasputin. He said that the picture show Rasputin as being a repulsive pig. Actually, he was quite handsome. But all those women with him, they were crazy. <laughs> so, uh, Yaka's sister, Pogremniak, uh, Alla Pogremniak, from her autobiography, she was born on March 1917, the 
the same day as the revolution, as when the Tsar abdicated. She wrote in her autobiography that she had very little food to eat and very little alcohol. As an infant, she had a wet nurse who fed her own infant first, so when she got the breast, there was not much milk left. Later in Vladivostok, uh, she had to scrounge for food uh, in, in the streets. Um, the revolution and the mining districts. The revolution brought changes to the mine. The British owners of the Verhitsets mining district felt that a man of peasant origin would get along with labor better than a man of higher origin. Um, of course, he had a technical training that, that permitted him to, to do the work as well. So, Yakov becomes the general manager. He was appointed the general manager, but the district was soon taken over by the provisional government with some payment to the British uh, company. Uh, Yakov um, brought with him uh, to San Francisco in a book we've donated to the museum here. Is a, uh, a book that would help them understand the workers of the very intense, uh, besides mining district. It told about all the different tribes, all different groups of people in Asia and Russia. It showed pictures like uh, reindeer with a saddle on it and, and things like that. And as you can tell from the cover, it was well, well read because it was a bit tattered. It was published in St. Petersburg in 1914. The Tsar's family was executed. First of all, they were imprisoned in a house in Ekaterinburg, half a mile from the Pogrebkamp house. As the anti-communists or whites approached Ekaterinburg, the Tsar and his family were executed by the communist or red authorities on July 17, 1918. The tablecloth. It was thought that the bodies were dumped into an abandoned flooded line of the mining district. When the whites took over Ekaterinburg, the military commander and his staff came to dinner at the front House. Maria served them hard to obtain delicacies such as butter and eggs on a table with the expensive Art Deco embroidered table, maroon tablecloth, which is in the back of the room in the uh, display counter. The purpose of the visit was to ask permission to use the district's water pumps um, to remove water from the mine and recover the bodies. No bodies were found, only some jewelry. So at that point, uh, Alcott decided to evacuate uh, the uh, um, engineer. Uh, oh wait, wait. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. The um, the families and their uh, the engineering staff and the family. Uh, 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 yeah. Okay. In, in the summer of 1919, the Reds were poised to recapture Katerinburg, so Yakov decided to evacuate the family and those of the engineering staff of the district. First, the families were sent to Tumen, an old Siberian city founded in 1586, about 190 miles to the east. Uh, the wives and children evacuated to Tobolsk. The Reds were advancing fast, so Maria took the children from Tumen to Tobolsk, to the northeast. Uh, Yakov and men left later riding in horse-drawn carts loaded with belongings. The wooden trunks had huge keys, and when, when the locks were open, they played a tune. Here is a map of the uh, route they took. They were originally supposed to stop in Tumen, and, and Yaakov was supposed to meet them there, but because of the advancing Red Army, they went further, and fortunately, uh, Yaakov found them because it was sort of the, 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 the traditional way to, to proceed from there. Um, the men brought with them the mining district's records, technical papers, engineering drawings, annual summaries of, summaries of production, wages paid, maps, official correspondence, and other things of value. I sent those records and reports to the Ekaterina History Museum in 2016, and they are on file there now. Importantly, Yakov also took the, the district's gold. Uh, I guess he went to the bank and said, Give me the gold, and they just turned over because he was the director, the manager of the mine. And fortunately, that made the evacuation and the trip to San Francisco possible. So now, uh, here they're in Tomsk. They were on the banks of the Irtusk River. After a few days, a steamship arrived, and they were some of the lucky ones who got on because of the gold. They went upstream on the Oak River to Tomsk to the southeast. 
They had to stay on top of some time and they had to get cold. Again, this is the route they took. Uh, next is the Czechoslovakia uh, Czech Hospital train. Members of the Czech army uh, controlled the trans on railway, railway. They could not go west through Russia because they had a dispute with the Russian uh, forces. So they, they, um, they controlled the trans on railway so they could escape to the east. And with the gold, again, Yakov was able to rent three boxcars to be connected to the Czech hospital train heading east, which had to ride away over everything else. Um, they went by train to Chita. One boxcar had a sleeper for women and children. There was a wood burning stove for heating and boiling water. The second boxcar was for the men, the third for the baggage. It took them three weeks to uh, get from Tom's gas plate by Cal to Chita, a distance of 2,000 miles. The trip was in winter through a snow covered forest, which is why it took so long. Here's the uh, route they took. They had to spend winter in uh, Chisa because Gali developed diphtheria, a serious bacteria infection usually affecting the mucous membranes of the nose and throat. So Maria and, and the children stayed in Chita while Yakov traveled on to Vladivostok, 1200 miles to the east, returning in the spring to fetch them. Again, the route. So they stayed in Vladivostok from 1920 to 1922. The Japanese army of 60,000 men protected the city from the communists. To make a living, Yakov went into the import business. He would make trips to Shanghai and ship back merchandise. Uh, Yakov uh, did go to school here, and uh, some of the books read by him and by others at that time were uh, by American authors, such as by Mark Twain. One of his well known books is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, published in 1884. Sorry. Uh, Jack London from Oakland, who wrote The Call of the Wild in 1903, and Fenimore Cooper, the last known of Hekins, one of the Indian tribes of the United States from 1826. From these, those books, uh, the Pogremniaks and others formed the opinion <coughs> that the United States was a wild, relatively uncivilized country. Uh, so leaving Vladivostok, uh, the Japanese army announced in September 1922 that they were about to withdraw to, uh, so that the Pogremniak family left for Japan on a steamship in early October, one day before the Japanese left and the rest took over. They took a ship to Kyoto and went by train to Yokohama. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, this is the uh, text of the visa application by Yakov. His reason for going is, I expect to go to the United States for the purposes of the affairs of the mining and mechanical manufacturing of very sets of mining, to study mining business and other mining questions. Uh, here is the visa uh, pictures, Yakov, uh, Maria in the center, Gal on the left, and Allah on the right. Um, so they boarded a steamship for San Francisco on October 9th and reached San Francisco on October 26th. One Russian woman had run along a cast iron bathtub, thinking that the U.S. was backwards by reading the books. But another passage, another passage is informed that they did have bathtubs in the U.S. Hers was seen overboard. Here is the uh, manifest, which is the passenger list of the steamship. Here's the Pogremniak family here. They were in the second class area. First class had a lot of Chinese picked up in Hong Kong. Uh, more British and other Europeans picked up in Yokohama along with the, with the second class passengers. On the back of the uh, passenger list was a picture of the Golden Gate Park. That's one, uh, where they, um, one place they end up. Um, they landed in Angel Island and passed through immigration there. Maria had brought many furs from bought many furs from Vladivostok, from hundreds of Vladivostok, and was able to import them without any problem by spreading them out in the luggage. Their first home was an apartment building on Oak Stanion. Gallic began attending a school at the corner of Hayden Ashbury. 
Yaakov could not find work during the six months he searched for some. Uh, the family decided to go into the apartment business, uh, following example of their Russian landlord. Their first place was a short-term rooming house on Broadway near Franklin, which they managed. Um, Father Sakhovich, whose granddaughter is, is here, um, um, yeah, uh, there, um, was very helpful. The rooming house was three blocks from the Russian Orthodox Church in Van Ness and Green Streets. The priest, Father <coughs> Sakhovich, was the only semi official representative of, the, of Russia. He steered many Russian immigrants to their house, so it was nearly always full. Uh, later, they sold their business in the rooming house and went into business and managed an apartment building at 1134 High Street between California and Sacramento Streets. During the Depression, occupants were not able to pay the full rent, and so the owner offered to sell the building to the Pergamyats, and they borrowed money against their furniture to buy it. After the apartment building, um, Yakov did the custodial and maintenance work. Maria handled the financial end of the business, showing vacant apartments and collecting rent. Tenants in those days considered landladies fair game to cheat, such as skipping out without paying rent, etc. So now we turn to the epilogues. The first one is about the Pogremniak family in, in the U.S. And some of this information is from the uh, Galax autobiography, the sum is the edition. So Yakov in San Francisco. In his first few years, he tried to find work in lines in the U.S. without success. He also wrote a critique of Einstein's theory, theory of relativity, which was unpublished, and analysis of the mineral, amount of mineral that could be obtained from the mining area, also unpublished. Eventually, he found work in a machine shop or manufacturing plant in South San Francisco, where he worked for many years. This is Yakov and Maria in Fairfax at their dacha around 1965. And this is uh, Jane, my father, Jim Kalik, or James, and Maria, also around 1965, also at the dacha. So Kalik um, did not, never did like the name uh, Kalik. When he went to interview um, at a, the Crystal Springs golf course, uh, he recalled that a classmate, Grodsky, had changed his name to Grant. So Kalik said his name was James Jacob Grant, and before he got married, he officially changed his name to that. Kalik attended the University of California, Berkeley from 1929 to 1933, getting a degree with honors in mechanical engineering. After graduation, Kalik got a job with the State of California Highway Department of Fresno. In 1943, he got a job with the Department of Architecture in Sacramento, from which he retired in 1975. He told me that as an engineer, he looked at the architectural drawings, and architects always try to make things beautiful. Engineers try to make them functional. So the two of them would argue back and forth how to make them both functional and beautiful. Um, Galic's uh, sister, Ala, also attended UC Berkeley, studied bacteriology. She then attended medical school at UCSF. She met her future husband, Terrence Hanley, there. They had one daughter, Eve. This is uh, James and my mother, Helen uh, Grant, uh, around 19, uh, probably 19, around 1941, they got married. So now I tell about the, uh, the, their children. Uh, this is me, the firstborn. I got a PhD in physics from UC Berkeley. I had a 30-year career developing and using laser remote sensing systems to study atmospheric constituents. Um, the second half of my career was with NASA uh, in Virginia, where I went to many airborne uh, uh, fuel programs to measure the vertical profiles of aerosols and ozone. Now I study the role of diet and sun exposure to vitamin D in preventing chronic and infectious diseases. Uh, my brother James A. Grant, the second born, has an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a master's degree from social welfare from UC Berkeley, and later a PhD in computer sciences. He's now retired, lives in Ithaca, New York. My sister Lucy Burroughs finished her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley, and later in life uh, got a naturopathic uh, 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 
medicine degree. She is the late wife of the late Thomas W. Burroughs, who had a PhD in physics, who also attended Berkeley, the mother of Laura and Sean Burroughs, who lived in New York. Uh, the children of Thomas and Lucy, there's Laura, who has three daughters, who lives outside of Ithaca, New York. Uh, Sean and Mary Burroughs have two daughters who live in Bozeman, Montana. He is part owner of a company, Ascent Analytics, that prepares weather forecasts each day for use for energy trading and risk management. Uh, Terrence and Olive's daughter, uh, Eva uh, Hanley Gordon, got an MD degree and is a wife of, uh, at UCSF, and is a wife of David and Gordon, also MD at UCSF. They're the mother of David and Felix, who now retired and living in Washington State. So the next few letters are pictures and letters from the Nekrasov and Rogovniak families um, from Russia. Uh, these are two of um, um, uh, Maria's sisters. One is Lydia. Don't know the name of the other one. Perhaps Sonia. Uh, this is a picture of the family taken in 1925. This is the um, um, Nekrasov family. That's Lydia on the left. This is another sister on the right. The, these two people here at the top, with, with no hats on, are, are two of the daughters of, of this sister. Not quite sure who the rest of the people, other people are. We have a letter from Maria's sister Lydia uh, that accompanied this uh, picture, saying, I am sorry for her sister. She is beset by unhappiness. Children are rude, <laughs> backward, and abused sister. As a mother, she does not deserve receiving insults from them. We notice what they do. They pose for a photograph in winter bareheaded, and nobody could stop them, and it would have been useless. <coughs> and here's a letter from Yakov's mother, dated 16 April 1935. Another sad letter. I've grown, I've already grown quite old. My legs refuse to walk, my strength is waning, and my eyes see poorly. Our family has big problems. I do not hear a kind word from anybody. I sit deaf and dumb as if I did not exist. In general, our family is a broken vessel. However, our life is getting better. There are no ration cards for bread, but we do not eat well. Dinners with meat are rare, mostly Lenten food. Uh, I don't see the money you send me. My son-in-law says, the money is enough only for bread, and I am the one who feeds you. These reproaches have so poisoned my life that it is not pleasant to live in this world. I have become superfluous in my old age. If it had not been for your help, Yaakov sent ten hours uh, on a regular basis. They would have gotten rid of me long ago. All my sorrows I wash with tears. On the other hand, all the daughters are studying. Faria works in a hospital as a nurse and takes courses in the medical institute, as is Antonina, who will become a doctor in, in, in three years. Lena died of, um, from meningitis. Sister Natalia's son, Pavel, works as a machinist. Elena married and moved to Kiev. And another daughter works as a nurse. Just uh, here's a picture of a 25 rule bill of 1913. And here is a 100 rule bill from 1907. And then a Christmas card sent by a Russian family, I don't know, it may have been a Russian family in the United States, but it wasn't Russian over that. And we'll end there with the family story. I have to tell you that maybe it is the first time when we have so detailed, so detailed everyday life, and this is very interesting, I think. So normally we have some general look, yes, but detailed, very important. Thank you very much, William. Второе представление будет от Лоры Филимоновой, она сотрудник нашего музея, и в этом году они вдвоем, она и Лариса Андреева, отправились именно в те места, о которых рассказывал только что Вильям. Это Екатеринбург, Тобольск и Тюмень. Они были... Сегодня мы расскажем только о Тобольске. 
То есть то, что рассказал Ильям, это начало 20 века, а Лура расскажет, что сейчас происходит в этом городе. So, I'll, uh, I'll repeat for Maria Kateriev that uh, the second presentation will be exactly at the same place about Tobolsk, that area, but they just visited in July during the Tsar's days in Tobolsk, and they want to share very short 15 minutes. Маргарита сказала, что мы в Екатеринбурге были, но мы не были. Мы были в городах, в Тобольске и в Тюмени. Значит, ну, цель нашей поездки была посетить только что открывшийся музей в Тобольске семьи Николая Второго, где они отбывали ссылку с августа 2017 года по августа 2017 года по апрель 2018 года и где бесценный экспонат нашего музея ковер, если вы знаете, вот там на стене, значит, э, находился в этом доме и где царская семья молилась на нем э, во время заточения. Значит, начинали я с карты. Некоторые спрашивают, где это такие города находятся. Но, значит, вот сейчас только что выступающий сказал, рассказывал о Екатеринбурге, о Севтобольске, Тюмин показывал, значит, Омск. Это, ну, это старая карта, скажу, находится это все, вот я отвечаю, находится это все в Западной Сибири, сразу за Уральскими горами. Вообще, Тобольск это древняя столица Сибири. Вот эта фотография, ну это не наша фотография, из интернета взятая, но здесь самое главное в этом городе это Кремль. Единственный Кремль в Сибири. Значит, я покажу здесь, что, что мы видели, какие музеи включаются сейчас. Это комплекс, музейный комплекс в Тобольске. И что, какие музеи он включает. Значит, самое главное, это вот этот собор, Софийский Успенский собор. Трехэтажное здание, это архиерейские зоны. Здесь конюшни архиерейские. Значит, вот это гостиный двор. И сейчас гостиница. Там, кстати, останавливаетесь. Значит, это э, дом наместника. <coughs> Сейчас это музей наместника. Дворец наместника называется. А вот красные крыши э, это э, тюремный комплекс. Ну, э, потом, я кажд, по каждому вам объекту я расскажу подробнее. Итак, город органично вписан в двухуровневой ландшафт террасы реки Кентыш. Лора, давайте с этим. Да. Ростовский, запер его в приказной избе и распорядился сделать на нем надпись 
правосильний, неодушевлений судочі. З согласію сенатора Олександра Третьева, вже по істечені 303 силки, колокол амністіровий. І от це в Кремлі, в Кремлі місце прибування колокола. Зараз на цьому місці, ну, колокол відправили, звісно, відвіч, а на цьому місці зараз висить копія цього колокола, знаходиться в Кремлі. При старшому браті царя Петра I Федора Алексеевича була заложена перша кам'яна постройка в Кремлі – Софійсько-Успенський собор. І стали розводити кам'яні стіни і башні вокруг Кремля. Це головні ворота, виїзні ворота. Офіційно основан в 1887 році. И строительство Кремля уже в начале, в самом начале 18 века осуществляется по проекту архитектора, историка и картографа Семена Ремезова. И вот по указу Петра I для поощрения торговли со Средней Азией, Индии, Китаем и Афганистаном значит, строится по опять же, проекту Ремезова гостиный двор на территории Кремля. Вообще надо сказать, что через этот город проходил торговый караванный путь. Значит, ну вот, значит, в этом гостином дворе. Сейчас это гостиница. Но значит, раньше вот в этих опочивальных, они называются, называются почивальные, останавливались купцы, это на втором этаже, а на первом этаже были их торговые лавки. Вот это вид из окна во внутрь Кремля. Вот один из коридоров, там написано «Хоромины прибывали». Значит, следующий музей, который мы хотели, мы посетили практически все музеи, которые там находятся в Кремле, которые входят в архитектурный музейный комплекс. Значит, первый музей это дворец Навестника, музей истории управления Сибири. Это бывшая приказная палата, построена по проекту Семена Ремезова, приказная палата, но потом в начале, в конце вернее, 18 века достроились еще два этажа, и значит, здание получило название дворец Навестника. Да, это, здесь музей управления Сибирью, начиная с 17 века до 1917 года, и отражены периоды от Воеводского правления до Губернского. Вот эти вот экспонаты в этом музее. И вот, посуданы фрагменты интерьеров разных эпох, присутственных мест, а также представительские залы для высочайших приемов. Вот один из залов. Ну, это тоже экспонаты музея, ну, это уже сказать, из личной жизни и культурной жизни населения этого города. Следующий музей – Губернский музей. Губернский музей – первый в Сибири музей, основан в 1870 году и построен на средства гаража. Он находился под личным покровительством императора Николая II и являлся научным и культурным центром Сибири. Вот здесь вот как раз и выглядит, да, надпись. Потому что император являлся высочайшим. И он рада своего отсутства, является покровителем. Это настоящее лошадь, не лога? Нет, это, значит, вообще в этом крае Ремесло очень Это ремесло полное железо, по-моему. Или витье. Ну что такое? Это очень развитое ремесло как раз на конкурсе. И таких по городу очень много разных структур. Ну я потом дальше покажу. Значит, здание, здание вот этого музея, оно сохранило первоначальный вид. Вот это внутренний интерьер в этом здании. Все как было, так все и осталось. Очень красиво. Экспонат этого музея, ну, я так понимаю, ну, поначалу он был королевеческий музей. Вот это вот животный мир и птицы, все, что населяют этот край. 
Представлены материалы, во-первых, сотрудников, коллекционер, их первые экспонаты, собрана богатая этнографическая коллекция. Значит, в этом крае проживают народности хан и манцы. Вот это, например, платье хантынской, хантынской женщины. Это, я так понимаю, татарская. Это шаман. Ну вот это быт северных народов. Так, это э, в главном больничном корпусе э, тюремного, тюремного комплекса находится научная библиотека. Э, значит, эта библиотека включает 50 тысяч хранилища, включает 50 тысяч изданий, большинство из которых редкие. Вот нам, нас завели сюда, показали, как у них хранятся. Вот как вы знаете, в каком, в каком все состоит. Все очень, все очень ну, замечательно, все по-современному, э, там и контроль. Э, Температурный и ну, нам далеко <смех> до этого, но хотелось бы. Так. Значит, последнее поступление в научную библиотеку Тобольского музея-заповедника. Нам тут какие-то даже книжицы дали, подарили вернее. Каждому музею нам какие-то подарочки давали, что очень приятно было. И вот, смотрите, а также подарки научной библиотеки Тобольска от волонтера нашего музея Хитченко. Значит, это вот единственная дорога, свос назывался, соединяла верхний и нижний город. Когда-то это была дорога с очень крутым подъемом. Но потом часть дороги, ну это вот смотрите, это мы уже спускаемся вниз. Дорога идет вниз. Вот арка, где арка, это вот эта арка. И потом дальше дорога уже где-то в начале 19 века ее сделали ступеньками, деревянные ступеньки, только ходить. Потому что у окружной дороги еще не было. Вот поднимались по этой, по этой крутой дороге. Часть она мощенная камнем, и стены э, укреплялись вот тоже камнем. А по обе стороны, значит, тут Кремль и Значит, мы спускаемся. Фотографии, мы спускаемся. Спускаемся в нижнюю часть города. Посад. Нижний посад. Значит, э, по левую сторону здание бывшей гимназии, директором которой был отец Дмитрия Ивановича Менделеева. В настоящее время это педагогический институт. В этом институте одна из аудиторий – музей. Представлены эти парты, все это начало ну, 18 века. Все эти костюмы уже созданы студентами. Все это рассказывается о истории этого, этой гимназии, потом это был учительский институт, но сейчас педагогический. Значит, новые жилые постройки вписываются, когда мы спустились, после, после того, как мы шли уже по дороге к музею семьи Николая II, Значит, мы проходим по улице, в обе стороны вот, современные дома построены. Но они очень хорошо вписываются в сложившуюся веками архитектуру новой нижнего города. Мне очень симпатично. Значит, по дороге к музею. Мы прошли по улице, пока еще не восстановлены купеческими домами и магазинами. Вот просто идешь все дома до единого. Все разрушены, не восстановлены. Единственная восстановленная церковь. От нее это как бы начало улицы. Вот мы идем к музею. Ну, теперь мы уже подошли к музею, к дому, к губернаторскому дому. И для сравнения поставили вот историческую фотографию. И сейчас как эти дома. Значит, вот слева, слева здесь на балконе, забываю все время. Супруга Николая Второго, Александра Федоровна. Ну, там мы с Кларисой. Значит, рядом э, с 
а рядом с этим губернаторским домом находится дом купца Корнилова, в котором жили люди, сопровождающие царство Сибири. Вот он тоже отремонтирован и отреставрирован, потому что он находится как бы на одной площади. Дом губернаторский и дом купца. Значит, здесь фотографии и макет в музее, макет с прилегающей территории музея позволяет определить место той оранжереи, на крыше которой царская семья любила греться на солнце. У нас такая фотография тоже есть. На стене вот там, если кто обращал на вот эту фотографию. Вот, вот это оранжереи, на которой они сидят. Значит, рестораторы старались наиболее точно восстановить исторические детали интерьера. В музее выставлены образцы паркета, сохранить которые не удалось. Это вот старая фотография, это вот такой паркет был, кусочек этого музея, этого музея хранится. А вот это вот, кстати, наш камера здесь лежит, который вот там, кто не знает. Да. По сохранившимся деталям были, была послужена лепнина потолка, а эта люстра справа висела здесь и во время сокращения царской семьи. Сейчас это, конечно, скромный интерьер, потому что, во-первых, не, не сохранилась ни мебель, ну, мало чего сохранилось там. Поэтому подбирают мебель ну, где-то этой же эпохи. Но и как-то оно выглядит немножечко скромно, скажем так, никак, никак не было. Кстати, оказалось, вот, что и ступени, и пылила лестницы сохранились с тех времен. Так захотелось применить к предметам, которые касались руки царственных ночей. И вот мы с волнением входим в зал, в этот зал знакомый, где лежал ковер, знакомый нам по фотографиям. Ну вот он сейчас так выглядит. Похоже. Коностас. Ну это не дешево. Вот так музей представлен в столовой комнате. Вот я и говорила, что подобрана, подобрана мебель в той эпохи, но, но не в час. Мы сделали снимки тех интерьеров, которые известны по старым фотографиям. Вот как раз аппараты стоит на поле, стоит на рисе. Вы посмотрите, какой интерьер был, когда царская семья там проживала. Эти много мебели, ковры. Сейчас это очень скромновато. Ну ничего. Молодцы, молодцы просто эти. Вот так выглядит теперь высшая комната царевича Алексея. Была? Ну такая маленькая кровать. В музее семьи Николая II мы увидели редкую фотографию монахини Пиановеденского монастыря. Монахи спускаются по лестнице этого дома. Вот и эти же монахини вот на службу. Они приходили в этот дом на службу, на богослужение. Покажи их. А? Покажи. Ну вот они стали. Значит, Иоанн Веденский женский монастырь, вот они оттуда. Был основан в 1653 году. При монастыре действительно действовали школы, приют, а во время Первой мировой войны при монастыре был госпиталь. В 17-18 годах вот монахи на свой страх и риск передавали семье Романов Котобольские продукты, каждый день приносили с утра и записки. А, значит, а, а в 1998 году этот монастырь был передан Котобольской Тюменской партии. А, значит, еще один памятник духовной православной культуры это Иоанн Веденский и Святой мужской монастырь. Вот мы в нем. Основан он в 18 веке, 
и известный монастырь чудокровный иконы и знамения Божьей Матери, список с которой хранится в этом монастыре, а саму же икону вот, в 1918 году значит, армия Колчака вывезла и долго ее искали, только недавно она обнаружилась в одном из храмов Сиднея. А в 1989 году обитель с разрушенными храмами и монастырскими постройками была возвращена. Он с Катерской Вот монах этот нам показал, открыл все церкви, пять церквей на территории этого монастыря. Он нам открыл все, показал. Хороший Значит, еще один музей, который входит в этот комплекс Тобольский, это дом мастеров, музей сибирских промыслов и ремеслов. Это резьба по дереву, косторезный промысел, кузнечные и кожевенные ремесла. Значит, ну вот мы там все в музее. Те, кто нас сопровождал, он нам рассказывал. Это Изделия из мамонтовых костей сделаны, из мамонтового бега. Ну и из костей, потому что до сих пор еще находят, настолько много мамонтов находят в этом крае, что вот косторезный, косторезный промысел не умирает. Он, 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 очень много изделий, но они очень дорогие. Помимо значит, мамонтовых костей, просто на обычных костях животных, вот вижу, вот белый, вот белый, да, это, это похоже, что просто из обычных костей живых. Сам. Ну вот человек, э, костолес, очень известный, Минцалей, его зовут Вот он демонстрирует свою последнюю работу. Значит, вокруг Кремля две большие площади. Торговая площадь, вот перед Кремлем, как и прежде, проходят ярмарки и праздничные мероприятия. На Бугизу мы попали на, ярмарку, на книжную ярмарку, только открылась книжная ярмарка. Очень интересная. Много очень издателей со всей России здесь вот показывали авторы, авторы книг, устраивали такие лекции. Ну и мастера кузнечного дела воплощают в Италии героев известных сказок, вершовские сказки. Каждый берется на себе вину, привезли с собой чувство гордости за этот край. Но нужно еще сказать благодарность э, нашему волонтеру Али Ранской за то, что она э, связала нас с людьми, э, и, ну, потому что она, в общем-то, знает людей из музея среды. И э, значит, наша частная поездка превратилась в интереснейшее путешествие, насыщенное впечатлениями встречами и знакомством с замечательными людьми этого края. Если интересно, вот здесь у меня билет в музее семьи императора Николая II. Это первым посетителем. Очень интересный билет. Ну, такой сувенирный, скажем. Вот посмотрите. Господа, большое спасибо всем, кто вот пришел, кто послушал, и те, те, кто выступали. Так что, Мария, Мария, if you have some question, you could, could ask me or maybe even somebody else about the second presentation. And as usually, please uh, help us to, to clean and to put the table with a piroshki. Here today, uh, I wanted to, we have a plaque for him, but he's too ill to come. So, uh, he's asked to be relieved of his duties as the president of the board of directors of, of the museum. And I'm going to be the person that, that succeeds him. So, I want to say a few words about Nicholas Koretsky. He saved this museum when there was a difficult problem in the middle of the year 2005 and 2006. There was a lot of talk about this museum being taken to Russia. And there were a lot of people that felt that the museum should stay. And 
Thank God, in my, in my estimation, it stayed here. So, uh, and Nicholas Alexeyevich Karetsky was a, a seminal person that made that happen. And he also uh, managed to get more funds, as also our, our wonderful uh, chief archivist uh, managed to get more money for the museum. And we still need more money, as you might expect, in, in today's world of inflation. So uh, I want to do, we, we created a little plaque for him, which we were going to give him today if he was able to come. And I'll, I'll pass it around. It's, it's just a, a plaque that thanks him for his work. So, and uh, we'll get it to him at, at home. So, uh, he also has a connection with Siberia. His family was a very important family involved in the tea trade, provided all the tea for St. Petersburg and Moscow. And his family also has a very famous artist in the family, uh, Kandinsky. Yeah, I think you all know who Kandinsky was. He was a member of that family. So, and he's, he has three sons. He was an engineer. Uh, we'll do a later uh, talk about his, his family also. We'll try to do, as in so wonderful way, Mr. Grant did for us today. And then also the wonderful presentation about Siberia and Tobolsk. I mean, it was, a, it was an eye-opening to see that town. We always read about it as a place where the imperial family uh, stayed initially under better circumstances initially when the provisional government was still in charge, but, and then the terrible events of and the Katarinenburg film you know, followed. So thank you very much for braving our, not our fog, but you all braved our smoke. This is the second. Tuman <laughs> Lutsch. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Мы сегодня спели церковное многолетие. Мы сегодня спели английское многолетие. Есть еще многолетие, называется такое частное, в хорошей компании. Что-то я напрасно выпил шампанскую, и у меня сразу появилось такая храбрость. Я хочу сказать, что, может быть, вы его не знаете, но он так легко поется, что после второго дуплета все начинают петь. Давайте споем. Дорогой Рите многое лето, Дорогой рите многое лето, много...